Here the Passover, he says, your lamb shall be without blemish. In other words, perfect. That's why it couldn't be anybody except Jesus that could be the Passover lamb. He had to be perfect. No sin. They shall take of the blood, strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. See the unleavened bread here? Remember we had the unleavened bread from the tabernacle? And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, The cup is the new testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This connects with that. If there wasn't a Passover, there wouldn't be any need for communion. And there wouldn't be a church if there wasn't, you know, a a Passover. Yes? They were required to keep that Passover lamb 14 days. So I'm I'm wondering about the significance of that 14 days. Well, they had to treat them like a household pet. They got very familiar. It wasn't just any ordinary lamb. It was something that they became very familiar with. You know, a lot of people really love Jesus. I mean, they really love Jesus. When you see those movies and they're all saying, crucify him, crucify him, that was a setup. They came, think about this, they came and arrested him at night Mm -hmm. when there was nobody there. They wouldn't arrest him in the daylight when he was doing miracles they couldn't have, they could never have pulled it off. They had to go arrest him at night. It was so dark they had to have Judas kiss him. So they knew who was being who he was, and they took him, they arrested him, they gave him this mock trial, and then they 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 uh, uh, staged all these people around, you know, they, there was a public uh, offering or a public uh, uh, oratory platform when Pilate said you can you know I offer you this Jesus or Barabbas well all the people they were all staged it wasn't your normal people the people loved him but these people that were there they wanted him dead now there's a reason they wanted him dead if you think about it in the Jewish economy who was in control I mean, there was Rome, but Rome allowed the hierarchy and the religion. That's a big business, big business. It almost reminds me today, how many are about fed up to here with politics? All the stuff's going, I'm, I'm, I, it doesn't matter, Democrat or Republican. It's like, I'm fed up. I'm so fed up. Because, because it's garbage, what's going on? Just plain old garbage. It's kind of what you had in Jesus' day. It was all stage. It was all politics. They wanted him out of there because they could see if this Jesus, if people followed Jesus, he was talking about the temple being torn down. Rebuilt in three days. Yeah. And you'll notice when he rose from the dead, that curtain was torn. He said, there's no need for that priesthood anymore. There's no need, get the, understand, there's no need for the priesthood anymore. There are people today in the church, instead of thinking of themselves as a pastor, they call themselves a priest. But Jesus said there's no need for the priesthood on earth. He's the priest. And he made us all priests, right? You can see what his intention was to do away with, with that whole thing, but... Jesus was the Passover. We can see here in Revelation, again, chapter 1. Remember, we're, we're saying that the Passover was the, what, the first feast. And the first feast shows up first. The book of Revelation, look at this. It says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him that's talking about him being hung on the cross and pierced and dying as the Passover 
right? So you can see the connection between Passover, the lamb hanging on the cross, and in the first chapter of Revelation, in fact, this one picture here is from Zechariah, says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And also the realization that Jesus himself claims to be God. He's standing there before John. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. I'm the Almighty God. So we saw the, the, the we, we, we saw the, um, Connection with the tabernacle. We saw the connection with the uh, Hebrew letters. Now, obviously, I gave you a piece of it. All right, I, I haven't been able to give you all of it, and you could. It's 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 okay to be skeptical. You could say, "Well, you know, I don't know about that." You gave me one little example. We well, need a few more examples until you're sold, and then skepticism is good. You don't, you don't want to believe things just because I tell you. Okay? You hear it, and then you go see, is this true? And then when you hear more, then you'll realize, hey, you know, maybe this is true. These were the seven holidays that, um, that were associated with the whole Jewish economy. You had the spring holidays. With, you could see them in order. Passover, unleavened bread. You see, in fact, it tells you what it represents. Passover was represented Jesus' death. Unleavened bread and burial. First fruits was the resurrection. Pentecost was the dissension of the Holy Spirit. All of those had been fulfilled, Right? There's fall holidays which have not been fulfilled yet. We're waiting for those to be fulfilled. Okay, so if these are in order, what's the next thing we should expect? The next big event, according to the feast days, would be the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets just happens to be equivalent, as far as the church is concerned, to the rapture of the church which we actually are looking at the rapture of the church in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, right? The next slide also shows us about the, the feast days. This is if you want to know when they fall. There's a red line separating the, separating the two. Uh, you can see you have the spring fest, uh, feast and the, uh, the later the uh, fall feast. The next slide also uh, shows you the, the actual scriptural reference there. So if you want to do some extra homework... Huh? Just thought uh, you might want to know where that is in the Bible. The next slide actually shows us the Hebrew letters, and it has on there the meaning of the letters. Hebrew goes from uh, right to left, and that's why it starts with this one. You see Aleph up here in the corner? And uh, that's the only one, because there's 22 of them. What we were saying here is that what we're going as we go through Revelation, through every chapter, you're going to see that. Every chapter, we're going to look at the, le- the Hebrew letter and see what's the significance. What does the Hebrew letter say that chapter is supposed to be about? And you'll see the connection. You can see the inspiration of the scriptures. The next slide talks about those Hebrew letters. I'm just going to read this slide out. The Hebrew Bible, uh, which is called by the Jews the Tanakh, that's the Old Testament, uh, and uh, it's called the Old Testament by Christians, it was originally written in a pictographic Hebrew script. It's not the Hebrew that you're familiar with, as well as a modified uh, form usually referred to as a Paleo-Hebrew by Hebrews whose language and culture was very different from our own. Because of this, it was through the study of the ancient Hebrew alphabet, language, and culture, we can better understand the biblical text. The ancient Hebrew language was written with 22 letters, each written with a picture such as an ox, a tent, a foot, or a door. These pictograph letters are, have, um, are more than just sound identifiers, but they also have meaning. Now, you can go to um, this website, which is called uh, ancienthebrew.org. This came from the introduction to show where I got this, in, this information for this slide. This is actually what those, anciently, what those Hebrew letters looked like. And remember, um, 
well, here we can see that there it is, Aleph, right? But you can see originally the ancient letter was written more like a picture, and you can see there the head of an axe. And you can see the meaning. These meanings for each of these letters is held to today and has been held to all the way down through time by the, by the Jewish rabbis. They've, oh, they've always, the meaning hasn't changed. Of course, you don't see the, these letters in use because they've been replaced by the, the Hebrew script today. But the pictures are kind of neat because they show you the meaning in a picture form. And it's especially helpful when you're not that familiar with the Hebrew. So what I did is I put that, remember we talked about Aleph, and so I put it up here. And so you can see Aleph represents the ox or the bull, if you want. It's the first letter. And I don't, did I change the scripture? I think I did. Um, we mentioned the, uh, that Jesus was in the midst of the candlestick. Oh, I, I see, uh, I see what I was, I was going to make another connection here. This is interesting as well. Um, I've got a scripture here from John. The reason I do is because something else I learned, which is, I mean, if this is not enough, what we've already said, and I, I know it, there's a, it's a, there's a lot of stuff. I, I, know, I realize that. It's a lot of stuff coming at you. But not only is the book of Revelation coordinated with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, so is the Gospel of John. And John wrote both of them. The same structure of the book of Revelation exists in the Gospel of John. And so when we see him talk about Aleph is the beginning of the alphabet. It's the, it's the letter. It, show, it talks about divinity. Look at what the first chapter of John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Over here we have another, in the same chapter of John. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend. Can you see a parallel there? This, and I, don't, I don't think this has cha- up here has changed from the last slide. So I wanted to I want to bring that out and I'm going to try to bring that out as we go. I want to show you the consistency and and the inspired record that the book of Revelation has to do with the tabernacle and the worship pattern. It has to do with the Hebrew pattern. It has to do with the feast days. It has it ties in with the way they worshiped and it ties in with the gospel of John. It's all, I mean, it's all there. And you have to ask your, I mean, there's a lot of skeptics out there. But this, I mean, this, this just, to me, it devastates them. It just devastates. It's obvious this is the word of God. Who could have, who could have thought of this? Who could have done this? Who could have came up with this idea? I don't think it was by accident. How many have heard you have uh, all the signs of the, in, in the zodiac in the heavens? Mm-hmm. Now, of course, like Sarah taught, if you were here last week, Sarah taught about Babylon the Great. Everything's been corrupt. They, they have horoscopes and astrology, and you can't trust anything that they teach anymore, right? You have all these false religions and mythology and false gods. And, and she traced the teaching of this from, uh, from Nimrod and Semiramis. However, the Hebrews, they didn't, they assigned their alphabet. Remember I said the alphabet was also their number system. So they just, re, they referred to the constellation as number one, number two, number three. Okay, look at this. Number one was the bull. Right? Number one was the bull. The letter represented a bull. The, the main star here, the brightest star in the constellation of Taurus was Aldebaran. It's in the bull's eye right here. 
It was called Kuiku, whose name meant the leading star of the stars. Just like the letter A in the alphabet is the leading letter, or Aleph in the Hebrew is the leading, it's the first, right? It has, the first denotes a primacy. In the same way, this bull shows up in the, in the, um, the constellation. This star originally marked this constellation apart from all 48 others as the one in particular, which was considered to be the, uh, the leader or governor being the very meaning of its name. Now, what's really interesting here. And so this is the first constellation. It corresponds. We're in the talking about the corresponding of the first letter of the alphabet of Hebrew with the first book of Revelation. We saw Jesus standing in the seven uh, candlesticks. Watch this in the uh, in the back here of the neck of the bull. There's another constellation. It's called the Pleiades cluster. Uh, have you ever heard of it? You see what we have here. We have the same thing we have in the book of Revelation where Jesus is standing in the midst of the seven stars. Corresponding, I mean, is this wild? Is this, I mean, this is wild. To me, this is wild. We also have the next slide, the next letter of Hebrew is a bet. Or what some people say, Beth. They be, here, this one says bait. But the, how you pronounce it, um, bet is usually what, uh, what I've heard. But the, the letter bet is used for the number two. And also, it was a symbol of the home, the house of a meeting or a holy temple. Since the very pronunciation of this letter forms the Hebrew word that means house. Okay, so... The actual, what they're saying here is the actual word bet, which is the name of the letter, means literally in Hebrew, it means the house. Okay? Anciently, you can see that the letter was written like this, and it, you can see it's like a door that goes in like a tent, right? Can you see that's a doorway leading? This was someone's house. Well, in the second chapter, of John, of uh, the second chapter of Revelation, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the churches, right? The churches are the house of God on the earth, right? The church is the we're living stones representing the house of God. In the second chapter of John, we have a connection. Remember the letter in John corresponds also with Revelation. In the second chapter of John, we have. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. What we have in, in John is the bride, the wedding, and the bride, which is the church, a symbol of the church, right? So, you, do you see, the whole thing connects here. Also... In John, we see um, another thing that's in there is when he had made a scourge of the small courts, he, he drove them all out of the temple and, uh, and sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money over through the tables. You remember when Jesus overthrew the, the, the uh, money changers' tables? That was the house. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. So the mention, the, the emphasis was upon the house, which that letter, second letter represents the house of God, okay, which is the church, right? The next slide connects again. The second con- constellation is actually, um, is actually the uh, Gemini. How many have heard of Gemini? Now, sometimes people call it the twins, but anciently, what it actually was represented, it, it most, mostly represented two people that were in a blood covenant with each other, and they used to refer to this anciently as Adam and Eve, or the husband and the wife, because 
the closest thing to a blood covenant that we knew of was a marriage covenant. And so this, this has always represented a covenant, which is what we had with Jesus. When Jesus offered up his blood and his bread, he was giving, he was making a covenant, right? He was making a covenant with his bride, which is what the second sign in the heavens represented. And, uh, Regard, re, regarding this constellation, the Hebrew name for this the constellation is Thalmim. The name gives us the idea of being united together in a common fellowship or brotherhood. It indicates a covenant relationship that might best be illustrated as two cords interwined together. And here we have, um, we have uh, the wedding or actually, this is the uh, supposed to represent the Last Supper here. But we have a thing here talking about the blood covenant. The blood covenant was akin. Let me get over here so you can see the picture. Akin to that of a marriage covenant in the minds of the people of old. And some of the ancients thought of these two figures as representing Adam and Eve bound together in holy matrimony. We have the third letter of the Hebrew the third letter, letter is Gimel, and you can see it's in the form of a foot. We read the, Gimel, the third chapter of Revelation, by the way, is the second part or the culmination of the church ages. Okay, it's chapter 2 and chapter 3 talk about those seven churches, all right? Gimel is the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's used for the number three. It represents the symbol of kindness and culmination and also a cognate to gamel, which means to nourish until completely ripe. What we have in the third chapter is the church becoming completely ripe before the rapture. We take note that the third chapter in Revelation speaks of the culmination of the church age under the nurture of the Holy Spirit. Here we have a picture of the the um, the bride and Jesus the um, the marriage supper of the Lamb if you will the wedding that takes place in heaven here's Jesus with his bride right interesting we said that the that John should connect to that third chapter again Revelation chapter three is the culmination of the church age coming up to the rapture what do we find in John chapter three we find this, he that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy thereof, is fulfilled. The word fulfilled ties with culmination. He must increase, but I must decrease. Uh, we also have that familiar scripture in John chapter 3. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody in the church comes through here. Everybody in the church knows this verse, right? This is where John, Jesus said, ye must be born again. There's people out there that think they're in the church, but they never even heard of born, born again. Am I right? And John wrote the book of Revelation. It, it, the connection is just, it's, here's the sign from the heavens now that corresponds with the third sign. It happens to be the sign of cancer. <clears throat> um, let me read this part and then I'll tell you a little bit about this. And because we still have we 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 still have the the um, the bride right we still have the wedding and it's got it corresponds somehow to this bride and bridegroom or Jesus and his bride in Rome we we find that the crab replaced the scarab or scarab beetle in the Egyptian zodiac you'll actually see a scarab beetle however it represented a sacred eb emblem of immortality and was often present as a memorial witness at a marriage ceremony. The sign cancer primarily represents the promise of eternal life, rest, and peace 
which God has prepared for them that love him. Such is the true meaning of the seventh day, which is appropriately called the Sabbath day of the day of rest. You know, in Hebrews it says there does remain a Sabbath day for us, not one that we worship week by week, but one we are looking forward to, like Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, right? And and even thinking about that scripture, what was Abraham looking? When when Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, we immediately think of the new Jerusalem that will descend one day from heaven. Inside new Jerusalem, it represents the whole citizenship of those, the bride of Christ, even, even when John's attention is brought to, to the, the new Jerusalem, the angel says, there, or John says, I beheld the bride descending from heaven. He was talking about the new Jerusalem. This sign, by the way, has always represented the, a, a symbol where the the uh, belief in an immortal soul and the the um, uh, the dead have to go somewhere. So it has anciently been taught that located in this area in space, right inside here, was the paradise of God. Look, at, and and the the crab itself actually represented a walled structure. So this this crab, it wasn't really an animal of any or an insect. It represented the 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 the, uh, the redeemed lived here, dwelt here, and this represented like a building. What this actually represents, if you look here, would you look there? It represents the New Jerusalem. In heaven, it re- represents the abode of, of the redeemed. And then we look at John chapter 3, which needs to correspond if we're right, right? He says, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. So again, once again, we have... Total connection between the Gospel of John, the letters of Hebrew, the book of Revelation. And we we talked earlier about the feast, right? The feast days. And and then we brought in this uh, this idea of these numbered constellations with the Hebrew numbers. We didn't forget about the feast days. Because the second feast day also ties in with... Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which are the seven churches, because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was all about cleaning the house for seven days and removing from the house every trace of of leaven, because leaven represented sin. And look look what these two chapters say to the church. Remember, there's seven churches. Is this house cleaning or what? Look at, look at. I don't know if you notice this. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen and repent. Then he says, uh, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove that candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. This is what he's saying to the church. Verse 16 Repent, or I will come quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. Verse 21 And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent. And he keeps saying, repent, repent. He said, remember therefore how thou hast heard uh, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief. Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation chapter 3. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and what? Repent. That's, that He's doing house cleaning. And you can see the first chapter of Revelation ties with Passover. The second and third, which speak of the church in the cleansing or... We can go back. Remember, we said it also corresponds to the cleansing of the menorah. He says to the church, he's cleaning the church. Repent, repent, repent. So you can see the connection with the feast day again. The fourth letter 
And this is kind of, we're going we're gonna to end on the fourth letter here. The fourth letter is Dalit. Dalit is used for the number four, Hebrew. It is a cognate with the Hebrew Dalit, which means door. If you ask any rabbi, what does the letter mean? They will say a door. Even the shape of the Dalit is like that of a door with its lintel spreading right and left and its doorpost reaching up and down. This anciently, the door was like this. It was like a temp, tent, a tent flap. It represents the entrance, look at this, the entrance to the pathway of true worship, which includes showing mercy to those who knock upon the door as paupers begging food or charitable assistance. Drop back to the Revelation chapter 3. Remember Jesus said to the one church, I, 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 open, I put before you an open door. And then to the last church, he said, Behold, I stand at the door. If you open it up, I'll come in and have a meal with you. That's what he said. He says it, it represents the entrance to the pathway of true Worship, which indicates showing mercy to those who are at the door, or in this case, knocking at it. It's talking about like a beggar coming to you know your house in the olden day asking for bread. It'd be like people begging on the street today, or the homeless supporting the homeless. Um, the scripture we we already brought uh, to your attention Revelation chapter four. The first thing that happens, behold, a door is opened up. The Hebrew letter says it should speak about a door and a pathway leading to true worship. What do we see as soon as John goes through the door? We see God on the throne. We see true worship. We see the angels around the throne. We see 24 elders throwing down their crowns, worshiping God. We see the uh, four living creatures saying, holy, 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 right? True worship. Uh, And here's the door of heaven. In the constellations, the fourth sign is actually Leo, the lion. How many know Jesus is the lion of Judah, right? One of the living creatures was the lion. Remember the only entrance, the only door into the tabernacle, which is the true worship is by the standard of the lion. Remember the lion? We showed the four cherub around the the tabernacle. The lion stood at the door. If, as we said, the constellation cancer represented like the new Jerusalem where the inhabitants of of, of the, uh, the, uh, of the uh, eternally saved are uh, dwelling with God, notice there's only one entrance... And who stands at the door? Remember, Jesus said, Behold, I am the door. I am. Je- the lion of Judah stands at the door. And look, his paws are coming. Look, look who this is. A serpent. In this, in the con- a serpent is trying to get to devour the people that are saved. But they can't. Because if you are in Christ... He said, I have said before you the open door. You cannot, no one can shut it. He even said, no one can shut it. If you are in Christ, you are protected. He stands at the door and, and he pounces. And do you notice that the, scroll, the first prophecy, the first prophecy was what? He was going to crush the head of the serpent. This is amazing. This is amazing. Um, what do we have up here? Uh, one, of the, one of the stars associated with Leo was named Mincher al-Assad, which means the punishing or tearing of the lion. We should not forget the serpent is the main target of the lion's aggression. There's only, there really is only one enemy. And that's Satan. He masquerades in many different ways. But he's the same serpent out there. Uh, Remember Revelation chapter 4. After this I look, I behold the door was open. We said that is the rapture, the bride going up, right? 
Oh, we have one more scripture because we haven't taught about the, where the gospel of John fits in with the fourth chapter, right? Watch this. We already read this part about that hasn't changed. So in the gospel of John chapter 4, what did we say? It was the pathway, the door, it was a pathway to true worship. So in the Gospel of John, in chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman, the Samaritan, at the well. And he said, if you knew the gift of God, remember it, it talked about in the, in the last chapter about giving, giving to the one standing at the door, giving, uh, being uh, charitable. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee give me to drink thou would have asked him he would have given thee living water ye worship ye know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews this next verse is a killer the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the father and spirit and truth for the father seeks such to worship him. Remember we talked about the tabernacle. He said you had all them sacrifices. He didn't. You had no pleasure in all those sacrifices. What was the father after? The father seeketh true worship. Where? In heaven before the throne like the 24 elders casting down their thrones or their crowns God is a spirit they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth I think that's enough to to get our head around huh oh my goodness oh my now let me ask how many heard this before I have never heard this before I mean, I've heard this piece here, this piece here. That first part that I, when when we first started, we went through the scripture and we talked about John being before the throne. We read about the elders. We read about the cherubim. 99% of your studies that you would get in a church, if if they're brave enough to teach on Revelation, that's all you'll hear. And yet there's so much. Now, do you see why I'm saying it's like the brain? It connects. It connects the feast days. It connects the tabernacle. It connects the temple. It connects worship. It connects the, the, the heavens. Well, who made the heavens? God. Who corrupted it? Well, not God. And we can't trust that teaching, right? It's all corrupt. Never did God tell us to be an astrologers or anything like that. We can't trust that. We, we don't worship false gods. But who made the stars in the beginning? And what were they made for? If you look back in Genesis, they were made for signs and for seasons, right? Yep. These are, these are, I, I believe the mask is off. God has, has ripped it off because this is the end. We're standing in the last days and God is just ripping everything apart and saying, Look. And what I have done. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Pastor, have you ever? Have you ever? Never. Did you ever see that in Revelation chapter 4? I studied the tabernacle. Oh my goodness. What? I can't wait till next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God. I know this is a lot to bring up at this time, Lord. But I pray, Lord, that we would, re- we would be able to remember the, the, the height, the depth, the length, the breadth, that we would just dig in, that we would, in our hearts, we would have the revelation that you just given us. We know, just like you said, I, I placed before you an open door and no one can shut it. You've given something to us today. You've given to us revelation knowledge that nobody can take it away. Satan can try to take it away. But it's just been pound after pound after just hitting the nail over and over and over in that sure place where it can't come out. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation. We thank you, Lord God, that whenever we have the slightest bit of doubt concerning the word, we know all of these things is not a coincidence. Your word is true. No matter what the world may say, We're going to love you anyway. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.